Welcome to this exclusive interview with Professor Wale Shoinka. My name is Ekene Ezeji. Now, Professor Wale Shoinka practically needs no introduction. However, for the sake of the flourish, let's do an abridged one anyway. Akinwande Oluwale Babatunde Shoinka, known as Wale Shoinka, was born on the 13th of July, 1934. He is a playwright, a poet, and an atheist, as well as a songwriter. In 1986, he was awarded the Nobel Prize for Literature as the first sub-Saharan African to be awarded in that category. He attended Government College Ibadan and later the University of Leeds in England. Whilst in the UK, he worked with the Royal Court Theatre in London, writing plays that were performed in theatres and on radio. An innate political activist, he participated in Nigeria's struggle for independence in 1965 and subsequently has been a strong critic of Nigerian government, a habit that shows no signs of abating. When the opportunity presents itself, you seize it with both hands. And so it was that I was swift of foot to take up an appointment with Wale Shoinka to have a tete-a-tete -a -tete on a range of issues. After what was an eventful year, and that's putting it mildly, and with an accelerated kickoff to 2021, I knew it would be a case of too much to talk about and not enough time, isn't it always with the professor? Having arrived on time and dispensed with cordialities, you don't keep Prof waiting if you can help it. We wasted no time in opening the conversation on a common muse, the state of our nation, Nigeria. And so I'll start with the fact that we're here at Freedom Park and begin with uh, the issue that's uppermost in my mind, an issue of freedom and incarceration. What do you make of the fact that Omo Yele Shore was recently incarcerated just as we kicked into the new year? The judge had to do what she had to do which is provide some measure of comfort for us who are assailed by these very fraudulent charges of lawful, unlawful assembly, as if we are still under colonial rule of criminal conspiracy. Who are we conspiring against? Bad government. Incitement. Who are we inciting? Our fellow citizens who are suffering. Those are the three charges before this court. So we are hopefully going back to the police. Yes. Uh, detention until Friday. My own conviction is that they will be plotting other things between now and Friday. But we are ready for it. we are ready for it. We are ready for it at all times. And as as I keep saying, I will say finally to Nigerians, Aluta Continua. Well, I, the first shock I had, of course, was that he was in custody. And then when I heard what the charge was about, I found that very strange. So I don't three, see... Three count charges. Yes, mm -hmm. that uh, on that charge he should be in custody. It's very strange to me. Um, I, was, uh, I noticed that uh, Lagos government has shut down some event center because people didn't observe uh, the COVID uh, protocol, okay. but I, I'm not aware that they were swept up into custody. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, then I saw somebody sent me, interestingly enough, somebody sent me a, a video of people on the, on the Elegushi beach, you know, Christmas and so on. What are you going to do with those hundreds of people, thousands of people who broke the um, uh, the COVID uh, protocol law, going to lock all of them up. Or, and then the third example, uh, you know, I was on the train recently, a couple of times in fact, yeah. and I was so delighted to see the markets flourishing, you know, along the rail line. It was like my uh, youth, I was so happy. But at the same time, I was shocked that these teeming, this teeming crowd did not observe, you know, just the use of uh, masks and so on in mm -hmm. such an atmosphere. Mm -hmm. So again, the question, why haven't all those hundreds of thousands of people been mopped up? Now, well, I'm just looking at some of the charges here. It says um, unlawful or criminal conspiracy mm -hmm. and attempting to incite others, apart from the unlawful mm -hmm. Oh, that one, I'm, I'm not even dealing with that. I mean, that's ludicrous. And we know what's, how it's all going to uh, end. There's freedom of expression in this uh, country. Expression is not just words, it's also acts, you know, the gestures, buntings, flags, and so on. 
why should this nation be different from other people? Do we, uh, are we equipped with only half a head uh, and we doesn't allow enough room for the sensibilities uh, connected with human freedom, liberty, expression and so on. So I don't even take all that seriously. I just say that this, uh, the security um, agencies in this nation, I would have thought they had their hands full of uh, far more serious, far more serious, immediate, urgent, in fact, nation-defining issues instead of this trumped-up charge. So uh, that's why it didn't even go in that direction for me. We've been through that, we're going to go through that again, and um, it's, it's, it's just sad that these are our priorities in the new year. It made sense to go from the issue of Shore's protest to that of NSARS, knowing how the professor had previously expressed frustrations on youth apathy in the face of our nation's myriad of challenges. I was desirous to know his reaction to the series of protests that appear to have come out of nowhere, seeming to almost metamorphose into a movement that is until the events of 2010-2020. Speaking of protests, um, we all witnessed the NSARS protests and the ensuing disruption and, and even damage that, that came about vandalism and even the tragic events of 2010-2020. What are your thoughts on that? You know, the NSARS for me is, uh, again, it's one of those, uh, it culminated, <clears throat> if you like, in um, a tragic uh, ending. Tragic in the sense that uh, uh, righteous, well organized, long overdue protest movement by a generation uh, on whom, over whom one has been uttering noises of despair, asking when are they going to get their acts together? When are they going to understand that this nation is collapsing under their feet and that they are going to be the inheritors of this disaster. And finally, finally, they moved. The youths moved. And then for me, they made many of us proud that, well, this is a kind of generation who seemed to have picked up certain uh, positive uh, signs in their existence and now are taking charge, which is marvelous. So that's the positive side. And then, Who's ultimately responsible? We don't know yet because the, the hand of the state is also heavy uh, uh, in, the, um, in the debacle that, uh, that ensued. We've seen videos of uh, thugs being uh, uh, shifted from one, uh, bust from one spot to the other uh, by obvious security uh, agencies. Uh, on the other hand, we've had accusations uh, against the military who fired this, etc., etc., etc. But finally, of course, nobody can deny the criminal element, the constant criminality, what I call the, the criminal, the preternaturally criminal class in all societies. And in this particular case, in ours, violence has become the only language. Horrors happened during that debacle. There is no excuse, I don't care what anybody says, there's no excuse for setting on another human being, putting tires over their necks, burning them. I don't care whether they're wearing military uniform or wearing police uniform or just in mufti like you and me. There's absolutely no justifiable reason what happened was the mob, that kind of killer mob mentality has become entrenched in this society. And we keep forgetting that this is what leads to what I call the, uh, the casual vigilante killing. My mind went straight back, for instance, to the death of that uh, aspiring musician during the Beidou panic, uh, the Beidou, Beidou um, cultic Thing in Ikorodu, and this poor young man was just going about his business, his car broke down, and the mob picked him up and butchered him and his people. 
and we don't understand. You see, it's about time the public actually examined itself. Into space. Say, what are we made up of? Uh, are there those among us who, if they got into power, would behave exactly as those kind of agencies which we're repudiating and against which we're protesting? So for me, it's no light matter at all. It's no light matter. There's absolutely no excuse for the brutality that occurred in the wake of noise, rumor, reality of people being shot at the uh, at Lucky target. Are you hopeful that the tribunals will see... So I'm waiting for the, you know, I've been following a part of the tribunal, the NARS here, etc., etc. We've got to get to the heart of the matter, where they fake soldiers, but we know that soldiers were deployed. That has not been denied. Mm -hmm. And from, we shot only blanks, now we're hearing that they go there armed with both blanks and religion. So let's just wait for the tribunal to do their work. And then let us see what action follows from the state part of things. On our side, and by our side, I'm talking about civilian side, we know the motivations. We know the process. We know that it went on for days in a quiet, real, uh, you know, almost sort of... Uh, celebratory map that finally we are confronting the evils of the state and then we know that it stopped abruptly so let's find out in reality i'm not rushing to judgment mm -hmm. but we know also that certain acts were committed which diminished us as human beings and i'm talking about the roasting i use that word deliberately of human beings and their flesh being distributed the evidence is there those who participated, you know, have confessed, and I've used it in some lectures of mine, and we've, we've got to deal with that in, in our own midst. And then the president in his New Year's speech uh, referenced the youth and actually uh, conceded that he would grant them, which he has been saying to his credit, he would grant them the five demands of the NSAS protest. Are you encouraged by that? Having come across a recent video where the professor gave a curt response to the question of his opinion on this current administration, I was interested to know what was provoking his response. I can take bits and pieces of Nigeria's uh, uh, present predicament, uh, but I think for one sense of balance, one should just forget the existence of the Buhari administration. Um, yeah, I don't want to talk about being hopeful uh, or being uh, uh, pessimistic. You know, yeah, let's just wait and see how far and how quickly those considered points are implemented. For instance, we're learning, at least it's been said now, that SARS is actually coming back in a new form. That'll be a disaster. That'll be a disaster, and that means that the government is asking for trouble. SARS has got to be uh, totally disbanded as a group. The SARS mentality must be totally wiped out. It must go back to genuine policing, with, of course, the special units which have to deal with the butchers, you know, among us, you know, the police in Boko Haram area, um, herdsmen, murderers, herdsmen, and so on. You know, those, those are definitely, those require a very special uh, policing uh, formation. We know that. We know also that there's got to be civil, civil police, whether you call it Amotekun or you call it community police, it's, it's the name really is the secondary part of it. The, the primary issue is what kind of training one gives them. And it shouldn't be just the training of arms. It should be the ethical training. They should have a division in all police, all security agencies. There should be a department of ethical training. This is what has been underplayed uh, all our years, especially since independence. It's about time we went back to basics. So my message to the state is you know, implement what you have promised and let, us, let it be transparently implemented. Yeah. I, I know recently that uh, you said that you were you're more inclined to pretend that this administration did not exist, but I, I would like to think that you're not encouraging us to play ostrich. No, I can, I can tell you exactly what I meant by that. I, I meant that we citizens, the citizens, 
I've got to take a very good look at the huge gaps, the huge lacuna in governance in this nation, and then take responsibility for their own survival. Okay. That is what I mean by that. If you're depending on this government, you know, after its uh, abysmal first term, you're depending on this government to rectify the huge gaps in governance. And, talk, and, and, and the methodology, the philosophy of governance. If you think of this government, for instance, to rectify, it's nepotistic, it's outrageous, nepotistic mentality, the putting of wrong people in the, in the wrong places and so on. I think in looking to this government to rectify even what it has admitted as being unacceptable in its own uh, activities, like you know, I never already used the word nepotism. It covers quite a lot of things. And that we, we must, and, and part of what I'm saying is already being implemented. What we talked about community policing just now, Amotekwa and so on. Yeah, it's a recognition of the fact that the, the civic part of the entire national polity has got to wake up in its own, not just defense, but for its own survival. The nation was captivated by the abduction of the Kankara schoolboys on 11th December, and although it had a happy ending, many were left feeling traumatized by the audacity of what transpired. The reason why I shot this video is not, it's a, it's not a reason, but I am convinced to shot this video by the gangs of Ambrobas. I am convinced. Sincerely speaking, the gangs of the Ambrobas are, are very scared of what is happening from the Jets. They assigned me to speak directly from this video to, to tell our government that they should, stop, they should stop sending armies and Jets. If not, they, will, they are going to kill us. Just, that is just the reason why we... So who gave you the phone? Are they bandits or are they people? I did not know who they are, but since they said I should say they are Boko Haram, the gangs of Abu Shekel. So they asked you to say they are? Yes, yes. What is your experience then? I, what I experience is really speaking, they are not Boko Haram. They are, they... During your days in captivity, what happened to you when you were there? I can see your clothes skin. What happened? Yes. We suffer a lot physically. And they, beat us. they beat us. Morning, okay, let's turn our attention to the state of insecurity in Nigeria um, and particularly to the recent events in Kankara where 344 schoolboys were abducted and subsequently released. What do you make of all that as it unfolded? Yeah. Mm. You see, that, that's, that's part of what one is complaining about with this, um, uh, this government. Can anybody stick, you know, outside maybe a limited privilege circle? Can anyone stand up and say, this is exactly what happened? Nobody. You can't. I can't. Because there's so many confusing uh, statements. And we, this is over 300 young people who were kidnapped. And they were stored in, you know, they, according to some reports, as some of them were actually seen being driven on motorcycles. I mean, this is a logistical uh, uh, challenge. Exp transporting over 300 youths, yeah. lodged on motorcycles. So they were lodged somewhere, they were lodged in certain villages. Have there been interrogations of those people who hosted them? I mean, why are we being kept in the dark about what actually happened there? You see, this is what makes our own responsibility for ourselves as citizens even more difficult because when uh, d drama like that happens, which goes to the very heart of our existence as human beings, you know, to see our children just being swept up, not for the first time. And yet, we cannot have a clear, a clear sequence of events articulated by the security agencies, by the government, so that can even take precautions on our own against such event happening wherever we happen to be in the nation. <laughs> That's 
When you reach that stage, you're no longer talking of a nation. You're just talking uh, of a contraption, which is just struggling along. And that's a great pity. That's a great pity. Uh, and the reason I put this demora is because there are certain areas in, in which certain positive moves to be made, certain changes to be made. I must tell you, I was, even though it's by no means ready, I must tell you I was quite impressed, for instance, about the work along the rail, uh, the railway, because I saw the stations and so on, so I know it's not just a cosmetic event, Lagos, Abeokuta, Ibadan. No, you go look through your windows, you see that this is systematic work going on very steadily. So there are issues like that. Unfortunately, they are totally overwhelmed by the negativities. I don't know how much you're paying for fuel just to be able to survive with electricity these days. I know <laughs> where it reaches. Yes, we know we've had COVID uh, negative, but before COVID, what was going on? So it's uh, it, it, that, that, that uh, can kind of say uh, could have even taken place at all to begin with. To have lasted, uh, and I know everybody's claiming credit. Even this uh, this arrogant group calling themselves Mayeti Ala, they even have the nerve to say that they were involved in the rescue. And my position is, if they were involved in the rescue, they were probably, in all likelihood, involved in the kidnapping of the children, because they've shown themselves to be totally inhuman. Their spokespeople have spoken so arrogantly each time there's been killing and so on. Not in recent times, but this is how it all started, and that's how these killers got their sense of impunity by declaration statements by groups like this Mayati Allah and so on. So there we are. Um, to what do you attribute the growing state of what I, it seems like almost every week we're hearing of one incident of either uh, banditry or insurgency or foiled attempts. Do you feel that there's a growing audacity to the way these events are happening at this time? You see, uh, uh, it's sad that uh, one has to uh, use expressions like the chicken is coming to roost uh, for this nation. We've lost a number of critical moments. You know, there, there, there are moments in a situation like this where just a single gesture, a demonstration of resolve, of firm action, would have saved, would save a nation years and years of agony. We passed, we had that stage a number of times, not just under this government, you know, it didn't just begin with this government, but it has escalated. It has, you know, it's, it's become almost uh, routine with this uh, government. And what the solution is, I really don't know, because uh, it isn't as if the warnings were not given. The warnings were there. I've narrated and I will say it again, times without number, and I say it only because I'm speaking of what I know, what I did personally. I uh, revealed how I actually spoke to the late uh, Aziza, the um, head, the former head of the uh, uh, NSA, you know, the one who died in a, uh, Aziza Azazi, I'm sorry if I've given the wrong word, which I ring to meet him and I said, what we're seeing in the forest when we go in, you know, forest is one of my living places, is different from what we used to see. The people we're meeting in the forest, something is going on. And I've made moves, I've spoken to governors, I've called meetings with, um, uh, with individuals, leaders, especially in the West, I said there's some sinister undermining of this, this society, this entity. What are you people doing about it? Are you aware of it? And we had a meeting and, uh, in which he told me, in fact, at the time that uh, he was coming from the States where he had gone to arrange uh, a supply of spotter planes so as to be able to monitor movements in the bush. Now, this meeting took place, took place in London, by the way, because it was, so, it was already so bad that I refused to meet him here. I said, even you people, you are totally infiltrated, you know, and so I'm not going to talk here and then become a, a target. Mm -hmm. And we arranged to meet in London. He was on his way from the States. And we spoke for uh, an hour and a half. And he assured me that they were aware of the problem. Now, that was nearly, how many years ago? 
and it, uh, that's close to about uh, eight years ago. Now, other people have taken similar actions. We know that. I mean, some former heads of state have spoken. A few leaders also, especially in the northern part, have also spoken and warned. But not early enough. A number of them were very happy about the situation to begin with for reasons of their own. Some of them used religion to cover up their looting, you know, for instance, the, the so-called uh, revival, religious revival, which went on over there and so on. At the bottom of it, gold, gold mining, illegal gold mining. And so they made laws to ensure that they controlled the mining using religion. And they didn't mind when the attacks were allegedly going just against the other side. Quite, they were quite comfortable. But now everything has got out of hand.